Welcome to Financial Issues, where we join reality with truth, helping you make the most of your money by honoring God with your investments. Now listen in as we give you the practical tools and advice you need to become a biblically responsible investor. Welcome to Financial Issues, everybody. Great to be here with you. Seth Udinsky hanging with you today. Hey, we have a very special show planned for today. So thank you for joining us here at Financial Issues issues. Hey, reminder for partners, make sure to check your email, your spam folder. We send out alerts this way. So if there's a sell, uh, if there is any updates or additions to uh, our strategy in any form, if there's a partner conference call, anything like that, that you need to know, uh, that will be sent out via email alert. It'll also be on the website, financialissues.org. If you go to the left-hand side under the partner tab, you should see alerts there as well. And you'll be able to get access to all of those alerts that way. So make sure to check your email partners. Folks, I want to remind you here, it's good to do this from time to time. If you're new to the ministry or if you have forgotten what we're all about here, the basics of our strategy, it's important for us to remember this. Five basics that I have here. Number one, long-term. Number two, diversified. Number three, boring, which is pretty funny. We'll explain that in a minute. Number four, slow growth. Number five, biblically responsible. Long-term, our strategy is long-term here at the ministry for investing. Eight to 15 years is the target that we have in mind. That is the goal. The hope is that you would go much longer, that actually that this would be a portfolio that you would have for life. We're not day traders. We're not looking for a quick buck. Basically, in your investment, you got to think of it a similar way as you would your marriage. When you get married, you get married for life. You expect to be married to the same person for 50, 60, 70 years, God willing, versus when we're talking about day trading, that's much more of a high school romance, a summer fling that you might enjoy for a little bit and then fizzles out after a few months. Not the same with a marriage. A marriage lasts a lifetime. It's the same with our investing. We want to have that lifetime mentality with our investing. We are long-term, number one. Number two, diversified. Okay, diversified, very simple. You don't have all your holdings in one sector, not all your holdings in one stock. Evenly distributed is your money. And this is diversification in type of investment, also diversification uh, in terms of your investments themselves. So you'll have equities, varied, dispersed, but you also have mutual funds, ETFs, maybe different types of investments as well. You've heard us talk about, you know, certain things such as gold before. We're uh, not the um, you know, the, the, the biggest gold cheerleaders in the world, but we've said before that if you have a little bit, that's okay for sure. Uh, that's the, that's the whole idea of being well diversified. You're not beholden to one company, one sector, broad diversification can carry you through market downturns. And chances are, if you've got those two uh, qualities, if you're well diversified and you're broadly diversified and you are long-term chances are you'll set yourself up to do a great job. Number three, boring, boring. I love this one. It is boring. Uh, not in the sense that it's no fun, not in the sense that it's not enjoyable, but boring in the sense of uh, we try to minimize risk as much as possible. Now, there is always risk when you invest, to be sure, but we are not in the business of taking foolish risks. Your money is too valuable for that. We are much more in the business of careful sustenance, steady growth. We're not looking to make those really quick bucks really quickly and jump into a level of wealth. We believe that happens over time. A man builds his wealth slowly. That's a biblical concept. Our strategy is built so that anybody can do it. You don't have to be a genius to invest with us. You don't have to be smart at all to do that, actually. You have to have some wisdom. You have to have some patience. You have to have some common sense. But you pick the asset allocation model that works for you. Uh, there's a couple main ones that we have, of course. There's the main uh, investment model. There's the Timothy plan model as well. Uh, you pick the stocks that you can afford from our buy list across different sectors, and then you let it go. It's a do-it-yourself strategy. You check it from time to time. You follow our advice on the show. Listen to the show as often as you can. You join the partner conference call. Stay alert for partner commentary. Look for those sell alerts if we issue a sell. Otherwise, you set it and you watch it and you let it go. Uh, and you look for opportunities maybe to add from time to time if you're looking to dollar cost average. But that's kind of how you do it. It's not it's not a, a roller coaster ride as much as it is a steady, nice, long car ride where you're getting from one destination to the other. Of course, there's always risk in investing, absolutely. But we want to try to minimize that risk as much as possible and do it in a wise, long-term way. Also, we're slow growth. I said this earlier, you know, a man grows his wealth little by little. Wealth gained hastily is not the way to do it. Wealth gained little by little is the way to truly grow wealth. Little by little will increase. So don't be discouraged, folks, if you've been at this for a year and your portfolio looks the same or potentially even slightly lower than when you started. Don't be discouraged. 
It will take months. It'll take potentially years for you to see that substantial growth. But the more you keep at it, the more growth you will see. And that's the goal there is long-term growth. Again, if you've been at it for five years, we would tell you you're still in the infant stages. Keep going. Once you hit that eight to 10 year mark, then you can start to say, you know what? I'm officially a young, but nonetheless, truly a long-term investor. And finally, our strategy is biblically responsible. Biblically responsible investing is simply values-based investing where we base our investments entirely upon the clear teaching of the word of God cover to cover. That means that we do not invest our money in companies that use shareholder money to disobey the word of God. That's biblically responsible investing. We keep our money out of the hands of companies that would dishonor God with that money. And so we screen out our companies. We screen them out. We don't provide you with any companies uh, that could use their money in a wicked way to fund such things as abortion and pornography and gambling and human rights abuses, the LGBTQ agenda, anti-family entertainment, anything that would grieve the heart of God. We want to keep your money out of that. So that is uh, why we're here and we're grateful to be here. So on today's show, I want to ask the question, what is the purpose of money? I also want to look at some of our proclivities that we experience with money. Proclivity just means tendencies, tendencies towards specific things, fear and greed, and how we can break free of that. So you've heard us say it on the show before, you know, money makes the world go round. And if you stop and think about it, it may cause your head to spin. Why do we deal with money in the first place? Why don't we just not have money? Money makes the world go round. Proverbs 20, 21 says, an inheritance gained hastily in the beginning will not be blessed in the end. We talked about that wealth gained hastily just a moment ago. It brings to mind this idea of the parable of the prodigal son from the scriptures, that his sin was the sin of greed. And the scripture is clear, not only of the dangers of greed, but also the fact that money is for more than just to be hoarded. We talk about how fear and greed are driving factors behind the markets, and really even outside of Wall Street, they're driving forces behind money in general. Obviously, fear and greed is not the purpose of money. Money is made for much more than these things. What is the purpose? We'll find out the answer together. I'd like to open our show here uh, with a clip from Dan Celia. Dan, our founder who went home to be with the Lord a couple years ago, talked often about the, again, the proclivity to hold so tightly to our money. And here's what he talked about in this first clip. We worship our money. That's common to man. Here's our founder, Dan Celia. You know, I wrote this book, The Fear of Money. When I talk about have we separated our faith from our finances, yes. Why is it we, well, if you want to know why Jesus talks so much about money, it's because of this thing that I'm talking about right now and I wrote about. Because we hold so tightly to money that we think is ours, we hold so tightly to it. We, listen, we all have this a little bit of worship at the foot of monetary uh, success. We all do. We all have that that uh, going for us or going against us. It's absolutely incredible. So it is amazing to me. It is amazing to me that we would rather lose half our money than get a permanent income for life because that means, <gasps> wait a minute, I, you want me to give? You want me to give it? I, I can't give it away. That's my children's money, you know, that, that, that they're going to get someday. And, you know, I want to leave them all that money. It's not going to be your children's money because you're going to spend it between now and you die because you got to pay electric bills and bills to pay. But they don't, we don't, can't think like that. I'm not, I can't just give it. I just can't do it. Anyway, I wrote about it, probably even sounded in my writing a little bit more harsh than that. But, you know, it, it just gets, it, it gets tiring. It's like I'm amazed. Every day I'm amazed. Maybe it's because I haven't been a believer all my life. Maybe I have a different sense of gratitude for the salvation of Jesus Christ and for the blood of Christ than maybe others. I don't know. Maybe, maybe uh, people take it for granted. I don't know what, I don't know what the deal is, but it drives me crazy. And that's a soapbox that I should not have gotten on, didn't want to get on. Dan was uh, famous for getting on those soapboxes. I always enjoyed him being Dan's producer for a year before he went home to be with the Lord. But folks, he's exactly right there. Boy, we have a proclivity to worship our money. And this is something that is common whether you are rich or poor, whether you are young or old. It's going to look different in different areas of life, different seasons of life. 
But we have to understand that this is common in the heart of every man. And so the question we have to ask is why? And my hope is that today we'll get the answer to that question. We got a lot more financial issues coming up here. On today's show, we'll tease this idea out a little more. We'll hear more wisdom from Dan. We'll hear wisdom from our current host, Shanna Bird, our financial expert. And then in the last segment, uh, segment I'll give some step-by-step -step summaries of kind of what you need to do here. So I hope that you will stick with us for the rest of today's show. If you want to learn more about our ministry, financialissues.org is the place to go. Consider becoming a partner with us at the ministry for only $132 a year. Lots more financial issues to get to today. We'll be right back. How is Timothy Plan continuing to lead the fight as you guys now enter your fourth decade uh, of, of leading this fight of, of biblically responsible investing? We've been too silent for too long and we can no longer be silent. You stand up uh, like Ronald Reagan said, you know, we're only one generation away from losing all of our liberty. It has to be fought for. I wish it didn't. Uh, and you can fight for it. You don't need guns and ammunition on that. You can fight for it especially with your dollars, because it's always about the money. Mm. And when the money uh, starts impacting people, they start paying attention. Uh, you know, when we launched this, they said it couldn't be done, but yeah. here we are 30 years later. Uh, they said you couldn't get competitive returns, but here we are. What a tremendous testament of God's grace. Go to financialissues.org forward slash Timothy Plans to learn more about Timothy Plan. Welcome back to Financial Issues, everybody. Good to be here with you as we answer the question, what is the purpose of money? We look at the tendencies we have, fear and greed. Hey, before we get to that, our sponsor, our first sponsor for the day actually is uh, Timothy Plan, sponsoring this show in part. We love our friends at the Timothy Plan. You hear us talk often about Timothy. They are the pioneers of biblically responsible investing, have been championing this movement for the last 30 years. We've come alongside them and been side to side with them uh, for the better part of their existence and our existence as well as to co-laboring ministries, as it were. So Timothy Plan really doing some great work, yoked with us in every way. Uh, they provide biblically responsible, totally biblically responsible mutual funds, ETFs, and retirement plans uh, for investors who want to honor God with their money. So check them out, timothyplan.com, timothyplan.com, or you can call them 800-846-7526. And be on the lookout. If you watch our program, you'll see Art Alley, the founder and president of Timothy Plan, a personal friend of mine and the ministry, come on the show from time to time. I love having Art on the show, uh, very much like Dan in a lot of ways. So it's fun to get to talk to him. Uh, Art and his team doing a great job over at the Timothy Plan. Check them out, timothyplan.com. So at this point in the show, usually we take a look at what the markets are doing. Uh, the, the market's moving every day, as it seems. Uh, so make sure that you stay up to date with us on our partner commentary that Shanna puts out every week. Uh, to get some updates on what the markets are doing. And of course, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, which is totally free as well. All right, let's hear some more clips here now from Dan Celia. Dan talking here in this one about the biblical code to money. Very interesting what Dan says here. Here's our founder, Dan Celia. I don't believe that there is a Bible code. I think the biblical code that I go by is the inerrant word of God from cover to cover. Um, the, you can't reference a biblical, 
biblical code and then invest your money in abortion. There's a little bit of a contradiction there. So, um, you know, or, or uh, support regimes through currency that are, that are um, grossly involved in human rights violation. There, if it's a Bible code, it's no Bible that I know. And it's not, uh, so you can't, you can't claim to have a Bible code and go against the nature of God in your investment strategy. Uh, it doesn't work. So I mean, I mean, I'm not saying it doesn't work from a financial perspective. Just don't claim that it is a Bible code. So, um, you know, that's kind of where I am on it. I mean, uh, you know, lots of people have disagreed with me on that, as, as, as you can imagine, and that's fine, and I'm okay with that. But uh, again, the Bible code is the inerrant word of God from cover to cover, and we ought to try to be adhering to that in all that we do with our uh, management style and our philosophies. Certainly is, folks. That's the code that we go off of, the scriptures. If you're looking for what the Bible commands regarding your investments, all you got to do is just read it. <laughs> read what it says. Uh, and if you're going to succeed as a BRI investor, you can't do biblically responsible investing without the Bible. Uh, that is the first name of biblically responsible investing. If you try to do it any other way, it's not going to work. So that's that's the core of our uh, uh, ministry thrust that we put forth here. This next clip here, Dan talks about the fuel behind financial fear mongering. Actually, these next two clips, folks, I want you to be uh, really keen here to what can happen in the financial world that fear can then stoke greed as we as we see for sure. Uh, fear is often the driving factor behind money. Here's our founder once again, Dan Celia. The only way gold guys can sell gold and silver, the only way that people can make money off of selling newsletters and books is to scare people and then offer them a solution to their fear. It is the greatest sales tactic, tactic in the history of the world. I could be a multi, 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 multi millionaire because I think I can be could be pretty persuasive if I had a town hall meeting, scared everybody to death because I know I could do it, and then said, oh, by the way, if you sign up for my newsletter at $230 a month or a year, whatever, you won't have any problems and you'll find your answers of how you can fix it. I would be a, a millionaire 10 times over. I mean, it is a wonderful sales practice. It's been used since the beginning of time, whether it was the invention of a wheel and some, some guy saying, hey, look, if you use this wheel instead of the skid you're pulling, you're going to save your back because if you continue to use the skid, you're going to be crippled by the time you're 35, but the wheel is going to solve your problem and they would buy the wheel. I mean, that's a silly example, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is this sales tactic is going to continue to be used. Even I've seen it used in the ex best economy all through the Clinton administration, eight years, his last eight years uh, uh, or the last six years of his administration. Economy couldn't have gotten any better. People were still using fear. Folks, we have to make sure that our discernment is very sharp. And so I would urge you as a biblically responsible investor to pray for discernment uh, because people are going to use fear. You know, if you look at CNBC, even Fox Business and the other big financial news outlets, they can give some great information for sure, but they're click driven. You know, they're based on uh, getting people to their website uh, and, and you know, cap capturing our attention with, you know, kind of sexy headlines and different things like that. You have to be able to use wisdom and discernment. That always has to be what you lead with. Dan talks about that furthermore in this next clip here of just discerning that age old tactic of creating fear. Here's Dan Celia. Oh, I know there's a lot of conspiracy theories out there. Oh, by the way, these were the conspiracy theories that we heard in the year 2000. In 1999 and 2000, the same ones we heard in 2006, seven, or seven and eight, and nine and ten, same theories. They didn't. They were wrong then. Now they're going to resurface it, and I promise you, they will resurface again down the road. Understand 
that since all of time, since all of time, one of the greatest ways to sell anything is to create fear. I could go in a town hall meeting and I could create fear among hundreds of people. I know I could do it in a heartbeat. And then say, I got a solution for you. Before you leave, you want to be able to relax. You want to know what to do. For 1995, I got a book out there on the table. It's going to give you all the answers. Well, I just made, I don't know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000. I do that four times a year. Hey, I'm just saying, that's what happens. Because the age-old tactic of disturbing somebody and then offering them a solution has worked every time for thousands of years. And it's going to continue to work because there's enough people out there that will be disturbed, will be concerned, and will be in search of a solution so that somehow they're magically exempt from the problems that are going to happen when this happens. Because why? Because they bought the newsletter. Very true, folks. You know, this happened with the pandemic lockdowns. If you remember a couple of years ago, the pharmaceutical industry took off because people were terrified of getting sick and getting their loved ones sick. I can remember feeling that same terror uh, when Megan and I were waiting to have our daughter, Eloise. We were terrified uh, of not being able to be together because of COVID. Now, some of that was true for sure, a dangerous disease, but a lot more of it was fear mongering is what it was. Fear mongering. That was what it was. Absolutely. That's part of why we have a cautious take on gold, by the way, folks, because there are so many fear mongers in the gold industry. So many. And we just want you to be careful. That's all. We got to discern that age old tactic of creating fear. This last clip Dan shares really kind of the necessity of money. And this really gets to the heart of what we're talking about today. One more time. Here's Dan Celia. It is a necessity for all of us. It's how we do business uh, in America will be for some time in one way, shape or form. Um, God has, God never called, um, money evil, but it is evil what we do with it. Uh, wealth in and of itself is not evil. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with having more of it. I, um, I, I would strive, I guess, uh, to have as much as I possibly can, uh, only so that I can do more with it. Um, you know, but I'm in a, uh, probably a very different situation in that, you know, we're older and, uh, we're downsizing. We don't need more. We, 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 uh, we can easily do, uh, more with less now than we ever could. But it is a matter. Listen, the reason that people say, why did God talk so much about money? Because he knows our tendency is to worship it. Our tendency is to want more of it. It's not, that's the evil of money and it shouldn't be that. But if you're trying, if your husband is saying, you know, if we have more, we can, we can do more. We can do more for the kingdom. We can do more for uh, our giving. We can do more for our church and those kinds of things. Then that's a, that's a great, that's a wonderful thing. I knew a man who used to give away uh, about $2 million a year. And he used to say, I only have one gift that God gave me. I have a great ability to make money. And so the least I can do is, is, you know, give a whole lot of it back, which he did. And he, he really looked at that as his ministry. He th- he, he really believed, um, that was his ministry. That's all he had. Now, of course, God gave him all the skills and the abilities to make uh, a lot of money. And he, he certainly recognized that, but, um, he, he, he never wanted more, you know, and he, we used to laugh because, you know, I, it seems like no matter how much I give, I, I, I can't get rid of it, you know, just because God is the great multiplier. And when you're, when you're giving freely with your hands open, um, you know, it's one thing for you to cling tight to your money. It's another thing to believe that God can give you money into a closed fist. Can't do it. You try to pry somebody's fist open. Now, maybe if you're doing it physically, knowing that you're going to put money in their hand, they will do it. But, um, you know, you're clinging so tight to your money, God can't give anything back in 
return, nor does he probably want to because of your attitude. So it really is just an attitude. It's not about having a lot or a little. It's about your attitude and what you're doing with it and what are you accomplishing with it. And hopefully, uh, the more you have, the more you will, you know, give. Well, our goal, my wife and I, is to give more this year than we gave last year. And we've had that goal for about the last eight years. So we'll get to more of this on the other side of this break here, folks. If you have to leave us, if you uh, listen to a shorter version of the program or you watch a shorter version of the program, we have to bid you a farewell. We'll be back next time with more financial issues. In the meantime, you got to check us out, financialissues.org. The rest of you, we got a lot more coming up here. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. easy to get caught up in the rush and forget about what really matters. Too often, we invest in stocks without knowing what they stand for. When your investments align with your values, your money speaks for you. Because biblical values matter, even when investing. Learn how to invest biblically and responsibly. Visit financialissues.org to learn more. That's financialissues.org. Through the ministry of Preborn, the Financial Issues family has saved tens of thousands of lives of babies. What an amazing job that God has done through you, the Financial Issues family. Would you join us in saving the lives of babies? What an amazing reunion we will have in glory, meeting all the people that we have saved. Please go to preborn.org, that is preborn.org, or financialissues.org and click on the Preborn banner. As of this year, more than 1,000 school districts have adopted gender non-conforming policies that intentionally keep parents in the dark about their kids' gender identities. To make matters worse, the American Bible Society now reports Bible reading is at an all-time low. We can't hide from the issues facing our country anymore. The undeniable truth is we're in a culture war and we must be engaged. For over the last 25 years, Financial Issues has stood as a leader of biblically responsible investing, encouraging the body of Christ to keep funds out of companies that dishonor God. We call that defunding the darkness. We're at the forefront of the fight, helping you not only with your finances, but advocating for truth and godly wisdom. Run the race with us as we press forward together. For more information, go to financialissues.org. That's financialissues.org. Securities offered through GA Repl and Company, a registered broker, dealer, and investment advisor, member FINRA and SIPC. Opinions expressed by Shanna are hers alone and are for informational purposes only, and do not necessarily represent those of GA Repl or the outlet on which you are listening. You should consider how the information applies to your situation prior to personally implementing it, and consult any financial professional you work with to make sure it's applicable to your financial plan. Well, thanks for sticking with us through that break there, folks, here at Financial Issues. Good to be here with you today. Uh, hey, I did want to remind you, you know, one of our 
uh, dear friends here at the ministry, Preborn, one of our sponsors of the program today. Preborn is a ministry that fights to save the lives of babies in danger of being aborted and also to uh, spread the gospel to mothers and fathers. Oftentimes, we will find that in doing the work of saving babies, Preborn is also partaking in the uh, gospel commission to spread the gospel to the ends of the earth. And so we see countless uh, eternal lives saved, mothers and fathers coming to know and believe in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, uh, all the while their unborn children being saved from the horrors of abortion. It really is amazing. Uh, in addition to all that, preborn doesn't stop once the child is born. They provide resources and help and hope for mothers and fathers and children uh, who are born in these circumstances. We can tell you countless stories about folks who have come out of the help that preborn has given them uh, into families who love Christ. And so if you want to learn more about Preborn, just check them out at preborn.com. Preborn.com, one of our dear, dear friends here at the ministry. We're proud to partner alongside Preborn, as we've done for many years. So uh, as we have been talking on the show today, the questions we're asking is, um, you know, what is the purpose of money and looking at fear and greed as well? Kind of why money exists is the theme of our show for today. In that last clip we saw, you know, you were you were listening to Dan Celia and he said, you know, it's not a bad thing to have a lot of money. R being rich is not a sin. Being rich is not morally wrong. Being rich can be very dangerous. Can be. Can be very dangerous because it's easier uh, to fall prey to loving our money too much. The more we have, uh, the more we may want. But at the same time, the more you have, the more you can do with it as well. The more you have, the more you can give. A rich person can be far more generous numerically than a poor person can be. That's just the truth of it. That's just the way it goes. Knowing your situation is very important. And, 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 and so we we're reminded why God talked so much about money in the scriptures is because of our tendency to worship it. We have that tendency to worship money. So one more clip here from Dan Celia. Uh, speaking of worshiping our money, a better thing to do is to pray about our money. And too often we don't do this. And so Dan will explore this in this clip here. A asking and, ask and, and, and answering the kind of rhetorical question, why don't we pray more about our money? Here's Dan Celia. We as believers pray about so many things, but we don't pray about our money. We don't pray about the decisions that we're going to make about our money. It's as if we say, it's okay, God, I got this. Don't worry about it. I don't want to bother you with this. It's his money. He's entrusting you to be a good steward of it, and we ought to take it to him in prayer when we're picking an advisor or whether we are trying to discern um, uh, from even a, uh, something that you might see as uh, irrelevant in God's eyes and investment strategist. If we are believers and we want to honor the Lord with what he's given us, why on God's green earth would we want to work with somebody that doesn't care a lick about biblically irresponsible investing? Well, it's not that bad. Yeah, they're involved in a little bit. They're making some money. They're giving a tiny little bit to Planned Parenthood. Listen, I don't care if they're contributing to the murder of only one baby as opposed to 200 babies. It's irrelevant, and I don't understand. I know for a fact if the Lord were here investing that money, it wouldn't be going there. Yet we will embrace an advisor that is willing to go there. Yeah, it's a really potent argument that Dan makes there of, you know, what the Lord would be doing if it was his money to invest. And, you know, we have to remember that it is all his, all of it is. Uh, he has entrusted it to us to be good stewards of it. So that's what we're trying to do. So we have to sort a few things out here, folks, based on what we just heard Dan say, going back to our questions of the day here, I want to ask and answer these two final questions with the time that we have left on the remainder of today's show. The first question is, why are we so tempted toward fear and greed? Why? particularly with our money. You've heard Dan say that the reason that the Lord talks so much about money in the scriptures is because we are tempted towards it. Why are we tempted towards it? Second question we'll get to in the next segment is what is the true purpose of money? But let's tackle that first one first. Why are we so tempted towards fear and greed, specifically with our money? I think a few things that we can think about with this. Number one, you hear us say this on the show a lot, is money makes the world go round. We can't escape from the need for money. We just can't escape it. That it's it is so woven into the fabric of who we are as human beings. Really, money is in many ways the fuel behind pretty much everything that we do. Now, you could think about that in crass terms. Many people worship money. Many people uh, 
for them, money is really the reason why they get up in the morning. I'm not necessarily talking about that. What I'm more talking about is the general idea that money is the driving factor behind, for example, why you invest, why I go to work, why I pay my mortgage, why I want to provide for my family. Money is behind all of that. Why do I come to work every day? Seriously, why? Why do I come to work every day? Uh, possible answers, actually true answers, would be because I desire to work hard for the glory of God. I enjoy my job. I genuinely love it. I enjoy coming here. But I would be a liar if I said that one of the reasons why I devote so much time and energy to this place is because I earn a paycheck from coming here and working hard at the ministry. I earn a paycheck. With that paycheck, I can then feed my family, provide for my family, provide for myself, provide a roof over our heads and food in their bellies and clothing for them to wear and a yard to play in and a house to live in. Money makes the world go round. It's not a crass thing and it's not a bad thing either, but it can make it very tough and it can make it difficult for us who are trying to avoid the tendencies toward fear and greed when we live in a world that is driven by money. That's just the way it goes. There's an example I can give you here, folks. When it comes to professional athletes, I enjoy watching sports. Certain sports have become woke and annoying, but other sports are still enjoyable to watch. <laughs> but for professional athletes, you have to notice, you know, they're going to have uh, a similar passion for whatever sports team they play for. It's not like when you're a kid. You know, when I grew up playing Little League Baseball, I loved my Little League. I didn't get paid to play for them. I loved it because they were mine. And so I played for the love of the game. Professional athletes may possess a love for their team. Maybe they play for their hometown team. Maybe it's a team that they chose to go and play for. And so they genuinely love it. But if we're being honest, they're, they're, they're playing hard for that team because that team is paying them a lot of money. See, as fans, we root for one team because we love the team. Oftentimes it's geographical. We root for teams in our city. We're not getting paid by the team. In fact, usually we're giving our money to the team in some way or another, whether that's paying the cable bill to watch the games or paying for tickets or paying for t-shirts and other paraphernalia, things like that. But we're fans of them because we love them. Maybe your dad was a fan. Maybe we live there. Players, on the other hand, they love the teams they play for, but the reason they love the teams they play for is because that's their job. That's their job. Gives them a paycheck. They use it to provide for their families and provide a roof over their heads and provide a yard for their kids to play in and food in their bellies and clothing on their backs. It's the same reason. Money makes the world go round, doesn't it? Money makes the world go round. This is a difficult thing, but it's something that we have to reckon with, folks. Money is important. It's tough to keep it in its proper place when it's so necessary for survival. You need money to pay the mortgage on your house. You need money to pay your property taxes. Now, I'm a big fan, listen, of homesteading. I'm a big fan of, uh, you know, being able to grow your own food and raise your own food, but you still need the money to be able to perhaps provide the resources to do that. If you're a farmer, you need money to buy a tractor, for example. You may need money to purchase animals. Can't escape it. If you don't have money in today's world, you don't pay the mortgage and you lose your home and you don't pay the grocery bill and so you don't eat and you don't pay for clothing and so you don't have clothing to wear. If you don't have money, you don't have life. And again, please don't hear me saying that money is the, the same level as God, for example. The point I'm trying to make for you folks is that money is important and we can't escape it. That's number one. Number two, with money, there does come a level of security. Money in itself is not a bad thing. Provision, stability, good things. I'm not talking about living lavishly. I'm talking about having your needs met. That's a very good thing. It's very dignifying for me to know that the hard work that I'm doing, the time that I'm putting in here, here at the ministry is bringing a salary home for me that allows my wife to stay home with our kids and allows them a safe place to live and gives them food to eat and can also give them some things that they don't need, but things that they love like toys at Christmas time, for example. It's, very, it's, it's a joyous thing for me. It's not a bad thing to be able to provide and have stability. Having a three to six months emergency fund, for example, very good thing. But it can so easily become insidious, folks, when we make that comfort into a God. 
When we make it into a God, when we make that security into a God, that's when we begin to worship our money. That's when we begin to really exhibit those tendencies of fear and greed. So point number one to why we're so tempted towards fear and greed is money makes the world go round. Point number two, there comes a level of security. We're going to have to hold off on point number three until the next segment. So you're going to want to stick with us for that one. We'll get to point number three and we'll also answer our final question about what the true purpose of money is. We've got more financial issues coming up right after this. Are you a Christian seeking to align your investments with your faith? I'm Shanna Burt, host of the program Financial Issues. During our program, we share valuable information about the financial issues of the day, including how markets and the economy are moving and how public companies are behaving, helping you to make wise decisions with your investments and the money that the Lord has blessed you with. Using biblical standards, we provide you with valuable financial insight based upon scripture, making it easy for you to invest in a way that aligns with your values. I can assume that most of you have investments in a 401k or IRA, but what I am sure of is most of you have no clue that the companies in your mutual funds may be funding the LGBTQ agenda, pornography, abortion, the list goes on and on. By listening to financial issues, you will learn how to get rid of those investments that are dishonoring God. Become a partner today by simply going to financialissues.org slash join. Click the green button to become a partner today. Navigating through investment options can be challenging, especially when you're determined to uphold your God-given values. Every dollar you invest is a vote for the world that you want to live in. Let your values guide your investment decisions and help to shape the culture in which we live. Become a beacon of light and pave the way with biblically responsible investing. Timothy Plan, where faith and finance collide. Before investing, carefully consider the fund's investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the investment company. This and other important information can be found in the fund's prospectus. To obtain a copy, visit timothyplan.com or call 800-846-7526. Read each perspective carefully before investing. Investing involves risk, including the potential loss of principal. The opinions and recommendations expressed on this program do not necessarily represent the opinions of the station or any of the program sponsors. Additionally, all products or services offered by the program sponsors may not be known by the program. Folks, hope you're enjoying uh, today's show where we're answering these really important questions. So why are we tempted towards fear and greed, particularly with our money? Money makes the world go round, we said last time. Also, with money, there comes a level of security. The final point, and I think this is most important, is that there is something inherent in money that attracts the heart of man to it. We are attracted toward wealth. We want to be wealthy. I think that this is where we start to see the underbelly of money, that there is something sinful behind it. And this is one of the most dangerous aspects of it, that throughout human history, there have been several base desires of man that have continued to rear their ugly heads, sins that are common to man. We hear them described as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I believe that's the book of 1 John that describes them that way. Lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes can very easily be applied to such things as sexual lust or power hunger or gluttony, but it can also be applied very, very poignantly, I think, to money. We want to be rich. We assign value to wealth. We think that our wealth will make us better or happier or more fulfilled. I can recall that when Megan and I were first married, uh, I I would uh, almost take offense to the fact that I wasn't making a whole lot of money as a youth pastor. And I wanted people to think, oh, wow, look at how great Seth is. Look at how wealthy he is. Look at the size of their house. Look at the finished basement that they have. Uh, You know, it's so young. Look at that. That was an outworking of this inward desire to worship our money, to assign value to it. I wanted people to think, how great is he because of the money that he has? 
And I think that not a single person on earth uh, can say that they have avoided this temptation. Everybody has been tempted this way. We've all stared down the barrel of a proclivity to worship our money. And I think that is the ultimate reason why we tend towards fear and greed, why there's such an issue with us, because we are tempted by it. And so to discover what the cure for this is, I think it's prudent for us to answer the second question, what is the purpose of our money? What is the purpose of our money? A couple of thoughts that I have with this one. The first thing is that money is meant to be spent. It's meant to be spent. I think part of the fear of money that we have is actually a fear of spending it. It's a fear of parting with it. It's not to say that saving money is bad or that spending money willy-nilly is noble and virtuous. I think we are actually fearful of spending our money. I know people uh, who will do this. They'll just hoard money. What they don't understand, what we need to understand, folks, is that at its core, one of the main purposes of money is to spend it on things we need. You know, you will see, for example, if you live in a house, let's say, for example, that you've done well with that house, you've been in there for a long time, the house is now paid off and it's increased in value because the housing market has gone up. That house is a picture of the amount of dollars that it is worth. That house is valuable. But I know people who have a mindset of in, you know, rather than spending the money on the mortgage, for example, something that's good, they'll just try to hoard it. Now they may still spend the money on the mortgage, but they won't spend it on other things. They will just, uh, you know, pick up every um, hand-me-down item furniture that they can. They'll they'll live very uh, almost in a cheap way. And I do think, folks, there's a difference between living prudently and living in a cheap way. And I think people who live in a cheap way, oftentimes what they do is they actually have a fear of spending money. They don't realize money's meant to be spent. It's not meant to hold on to like this. If you need to, oh, I don't know, put money away in savings, that's a good thing. If you need to buy a life insurance policy, a term life insurance policy as a, as a young person, that could potentially be a very good way to spend money, a prudent way to do it, things like that. If you want to learn more about life insurance policies, you can talk to Shanna during our live show. Money is not meant to be sat on, it is meant to be spent. I think that's the first purpose of money is that it should be spent. Number two, money is meant to be saved and grown wisely. So money should not be sat on, but it also shouldn't just be spent willy-nilly on everything. It's prudent to be able to save money as well. Since we are not God, folks, we cannot tell the future. We have to be wise about the money that we have, about putting it away for potential future needs. Our founder, Dan Celia, used to say this often, that we need to live as if Jesus will return today, but we have to plan financially, especially as if he won't come back for another hundred years or more. And that is very true. We must do that. Money is also meant to be grown as it is saved as well. So you've got, Shanna talks about this, the saving buckets and the investing buckets. This is done through working hard and earning more. It's also done through investing. It's good that your money grows over time. That's why we get so excited whenever we hear young people calling into the show or asking questions, because we know that that time that you have is your greatest ally. And the more time you have, the more you get started early on saving and investing and spending your money well and, and spending it on the right things and saving it and doing the things that you need to do, the better you're going to be later on down the road when, you know, say you got someone, I, I know folks who call into our show who are 23 years old, 29 years old. Say now you're in your 60s and 70s, and at that point, you would hope that the house is paid off. You would hope to be able to have uh, some money set aside because you probably won't be working for much longer, maybe. You might have children, grandchildren, maybe even great-grandchildren at that point. Money is meant to be grown long-term. It's meant to be grown. That's why we offer the strategy we do. It's a long-term strategy. It's well diversified so that you can have the best opportunity to grow wealth over a long period of time. I'm not talking about get rich quick schemes. That's not how money is meant to be grown. It's meant to be grown slowly over time. So number one, money is meant to be spent. Number two, it's meant to be saved and grown. Number three, money is meant to be used for lavish generosity. 
Lavish generosity. Lavishness, folks, is sometimes, oftentimes actually associated with wealth hoarding. It's associated with reckless living. You know, people who are lavish tend to spend money on anything and everything. You'll hear stories, again, I mentioned professional athletes earlier. A lot of professional athletes end up broke or bankrupt because when they get that first big contract, that's more money than they've ever sniffed in their entire life. And they don't know how to spend it well. They don't know how to save it. They don't know how to invest it. So they just spend it on whatever they want. And they buy massive homes and beautiful cars and they live the high life and they end up losing it all. When we talk about lavishness in, a ter in terms of the wise investor, we need to be lavish in how generous we are. I don't mean reckless. I mean that we are open to being exceedingly generous as God himself is. This might look different for some of us than others. I'll be honest with you. I cannot be as generous as many of you can. I don't have as much money as you do. But the ratio of lavish generosity, I can still hit that ratio of being exceedingly generous with what the Lord has given to me. You can do the same thing. It might look different. Your actual number may be a lot higher than mine is, might be lower. The goal is to be exceedingly generous. It means we hold everything with open hands. It means we seek opportunities to be generous. We don't just wait for them to come to us. We seek them out, whether it's toward our churches, first and foremost, families and friends, other ministries that we love. Even if it's something as simple as taking your friends out to eat and paying for the meal and paying for the tip. That's a very simple thing to do. Folks, you're not taking any of this with you, not taking your money with you. Uh, so you should be lavishly generous with it as your father in heaven is generous and boy he has been lavishly generous uh, he has after all sent his one and only son to save his people we can't outgive god none of us can be that generous but we can be generous like he is as well in fact that should be our goal that's what we should be and that leads to the last point there and i do think that this also is the the key the antidote to fear and greed is that money should be used as an act of worship to God. Is that when we use our money to worship the Lord, we are not using it uh, to be greedy and we're not listening to the voices of fear as well either. You know, money is at its core a neutral tool. It's just like a gun or fire or water or a car. All those things can be used for great evil. They can also be used to save lives. They also can be used for good. Money's the same way. And the greatest thing money can be used for is when it is used as an act of worship to God. Now, some of the ways we can do this is through generosity, as we just mentioned, also through deploying money for good, investing in companies that do not grieve God's heart. That's why we put forth the strategy that we do here at the ministry. And so friends, the purpose of money, I believe at its core, is that it is to be used as an act of worship to God, it is to be used to make much of the name of Jesus Christ. If you're using your money to spread the gospel and to glorify God, you are using it right. Now, included in all of that could be providing for your family, tithing to your church, investing with financial issues. All of that can be used for great glory, for the glory of God. So ask yourself this question, am I using my money, which is really God's money, to do this? And if you're doing that, then we believe you will be very, very successful. Well, I hope that that answered the question here, folks. It was a joy to be with you today on the show. We've come to the end. But I hope that you will continue to listen to this program. Again, if you want more information about our ministry, financialissues.org is the place to go, financialissues.org. I appreciate you all so much. And I want you to remember, regardless of anything that's happening in the world, in your personal life, remember this, that the Lord is on the throne and all you have belongs to him. So it is to be used to make much of his name. Let's be found good and faithful servants with the money that God has given to us. And until next time, I'm Seth Udinsky. Check us out at financialissues.org and we'll see you next time. Have a great day. If we ever forget that we're one nation under God, then we will be a nation gone under. Thank you for joining us. This has been an FISM production.